exactly. Hi, everyone. I'm Swizz, and um, I have a question for you all. Who here has built a website? Yeah, you've built a website? It's really hard, right? Like, you have to. You have to build the HTML, and then the CSS, and then you have to configure your Apache server, and then you have to deal with the CDN, and maybe a SQL database, and then you have to figure out where, you, where to put all of that stuff, and it's just, like, how long does it usually take you to start with an idea and have a project that's deployed to the internet, has a .com domain, and maybe an SSL certificate or two, and won't die when more than five people come to your website? One day? I think it can. I mean, when I, when, yeah, that's the, that's the premise here, but I think when I, in the olden days, it took a lot longer than that. So what, this, uh, this is a, what's this called? A time lapse of me building an entire pro product and launching it in a day as part of a challenge. And today I kind of want to show you, I want to show you how great the, the modern web has become and how cool all of these tools with uh, the modern web stack, the jam stack and serverless, and GraphQL and all of that is so great that you can build a startup in not a lot of time. So I'm going to start with a little bit of the why behind it and some of the ideas. And then I'm going to try to perform a magic trick and build and deploy a web app to a .com domain, which I don't own yet. So I'm going to buy it here. And I'm, we're going to try to deploy something in about 30 minutes that you will be able to use on your phone and add data to my database. So we're going to build a project from basically from scratch that's going to be a web app that works on mobile, loads fast, has server-side rendering, is built in JavaScript front and back, has a database, an API, documentation for the API, and a domain. And we're going to try to do that in about half an hour. So we'll see. Um, the first thing I wanted to show you is a tweet from Chris Coyer. The, he's the guy behind, I think, CSS Tricks or Smashing Magazine, one of those two. Either way, he's a really cool guy, and he knows a lot of things. And I thought this tweet was really interesting, where he says that front-end developers, they, are, they can be, you know, who here is a front-end developer? Okay, who here is a back-end developer? Yay, okay, so one of the things that both of us struggle with is you're, you're good at the front end and you can build amazing things if somebody sets up the infrastructure for you. Or you're really great at the back end and you can build amazing infrastructures and scalable APIs and you can deal with a million requests per second and somebody asks you to write some CSS and you're like, uh, how do I do that again? And that's kind of the problem with how we're doing the web currently where we have this separation of concerns in a weird way and nobody knows how to build a damn website anymore. Like, how do you actually build a site project? You have a great idea for a problem you want to solve or something, and it's hard to even get started because there's just too much stuff out there. But I don't think it needs to be that way. Um, so I want, to sh I want to talk about what if you could do everything? What if you could have an idea, and if you're a front-end developer, you could use your existing knowledge to build the backend for your idea, deploy it, and not worry about any of the DevOps or CDNs or DNS or all of those weird things that people used to have to care about 10 years ago. And if you're a backend engineer, you might have to learn some JavaScript and some CSS. That's just how it is. But you can, you're going to save so much time on the backend stuff using serverless or uh, some of these providers that you'll have time to learn that stuff. And it's going to be fun. And um, actually, I worked with a person recently who, like, he was, he was on my team. He came on my team after something like 20 years of Java development, and he just said, dude, the backend is just so boring. I do all of these things, and all I can do is look at graphs and the lines wiggling around, but I don't build anything that I can interact with or that I can play with. And I, th I thought that was kind of, I, I understand that, because I'm doing a lot of backend now, and I miss when I did more front-end stuff, because it's fun to build something that you can look at and play with. And uh, the problem is that once you're a back-end engineer, that stuff has so far been so difficult that they're like, everyone's like, OK, you know back-end, please stay there. Don't go anywhere else. Just keep doing that, because we need you to do that, because nobody else can do it. Um, whereas the front-end, it seems like most people who go into the web industry kind of go from the front-end side these days. So there's a lot, of, a lot more people there. So 
this talk was originally kind of more aimed towards front-end engineers, but I think we have a different crowd here. So it's now kind of aimed at everyone. But basically, I'm, my theory is that right now is the best time on the web to build things really quickly. And re um, a couple of months ago, a friend of mine, Pat Walls, launched a challenge. He, he launched a 24-hour startup challenge and said, come, come one, come all. Can you build a startup from scratch in 24 hours and launch it? Maybe make some money? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like a cool idea. So I built a, uh, so there were 96 of us, and we all live streamed our builds. And what I built was a little tool. Let's see, how do I get out of this? Help. OK. Um, for some reason, it won't let me switch desktops if it's in full screen mode. So. For that 24-hour startup challenge, I built an app that I used to create my mailing letters or my, my newsletter. And it's essentially a Markdown converter to HTML. Does everyone know what Markdown is? Have you used Markdown before? Perfect. So instead of typing a bunch of Markdown here, I'm going to show you the example. And you have a, essentially on the left, you write Markdown. And on the right, you get rendered output. What's really interesting about this is that this image is originally 2550 pixels wide, but the one that comes out in your output is perfect to, Im oh, I copied the image, not the URL. Copy image address. So you see the original URL is some unsplash.com, whatever. But when my, oh, okay. I guess that doesn't work anymore. So it used to, what it used to do is take that and make a small optimized version of it. But the part that is going to work is that I embedded a tweet and it created a screenshot of that tweet so that you can put it in an email because you can't embed emails in your, um, you can't embed tweets in email because email clients don't have HTML. So I built this tool that takes every tweet and puts it on, um, goes to a server, in the background it goes to a serverless function, spins up Chrome, takes a screenshot with that Chrome puppeteer, whatever, uploads it to S3, minimizes it, and puts it here. It also does YouTube links, so you can, you can take a YouTube URL and it, gets a, it creates a thumbnail. Or even code blocks, and Instagram, and code sandbox, and a bunch of things like that. So what's really cool about this is that I was able to build this without really knowing what I'm doing in about a day. So now if I say const blah equal, const sv equals hello, I'll show you that it's not just a dumb demo that only does demo things. It can do, in theory, it should be able to do this live. I'm going to click reload just in case. Why is it so slow? Maybe it died. The Wi-Fi isn't working. That's going to be a problem for my, for my experiment. Um, let's see, is the Wi-Fi really not working? Google Maps loads. So it's saying that, okay, it showed up, nice. So you see, um, it goes to this carbon now. You may have seen, oh right, my keyboard. You may have seen um, screenshots of tweets that people post on the internet. It's usually with the carbon site. I made that so that you can, anything that you embed, any code that you put in Markdown gets screenshotted with a, with a Chrome that runs on serverless. And the nice thing about this is that when nobody's using it, I'm not paying for anything. It's all free. Because one, one benefit of serverless is that it's very cheap to get started because you're only paying for code when you're actually running it rather than for servers that are utilized 5% of the time or even less than that. So this is a cool example of a thing I built, I worked on it for a little bit, for a little bit afterwards. And it's, um, I use it a lot actually. And what else? So that's like one of the examples. Now, instead of really uh, continuing to talk too much, I'm just gonna show you and we're gonna try to do the magic trick of building an app. So who here has called of the cube rule before? Cube rule, okay. Who here thinks a hot dog is a taco? Raise your hands, right? So the cube rule came out a couple of years ago. Maybe it was last year. And it's basically a 
unified theory of food identification. It uses a cube to say, uh, to help you decide what is a, what is a sandwich, what is a, what is a taco, and what is a quiche, what is a pie, and it turns out that steak is a salad. So what we're gonna build, uh, this is very scientific and there's a rule and a unified theory of everything. We're not gonna scroll through this whole page. Instead, we're gonna build a small app that will let you vote on whether a hot dog is a taco. So let's see if we can pull that off. I, I learned yesterday from running this as an experiment on my YouTube channel that I need to prepare some boilerplate because otherwise it would take us too long. So I prepared a simple Gatsby build. Who knows what Gatsby is? Okay, Gatsby is a static site generator where you build your entire app in React and it uh, compiles into HTML files that you can host from pretty much anywhere. And I like to use that as a starting base for my React projects because that way they load really fast and they work without JavaScript. Um, I actually had a, deployed a website recently in React where that had a bug and the bug fix was just disable JavaScript and then it's gonna work. Which is really weird for a JavaScript site, right? <laughs> um, but with Gatsby you can do stuff like that and that's part of what makes the modern web so cool. So I'm going to show you some boilerplate that I created. Can you read this? I'm gonna, can I, let me zoom in a little bit more. So clear ls, we have a project directory with a server side and a web side. Server is going to be for our backend, and web is for our entire front end. If you look at the web part, I just I ran a Gatsby generator, added some dependencies, and now we have a bunch of configuration files that I'll show you in a little bit, and a source, and we have the entire build pipeline set up, and we have a local, uh, we can run a local server. So I run yarn start, and it sets up a server for me that has live updates so that as we're, co as we're writing the code, we're going to see our web app update live, which is always very useful when you're trying to build something really quickly. On the server side, I haven't really prepared much. I installed a bunch of dependencies. I configured the TypeScript compiler so that we have builds and all of that working. And I haven't configured any of the serverless stuff yet. So we're going to write a little bit of code. Let's start with the server side. Um, or actually, let's start with the front side. So we open web index.js, and this is, uh, I need to switch it to React mode. And don't worry, if I get stuck, I have prepared a cliff notes that I can copy paste from. So index.js, we have a typical React structure. How familiar are you all with React? Okay, cool. So. For those of you who are unfamiliar, this is JSX where we are writing a code that looks like HTML directly in our JavaScript. It is actually, it actually compiles to JavaScript uh, and then does stuff. And because of Gatsby, we can now delete uh, some code here and say is hot dog taco, right? And it's going to change on the left live without a, without a reload. And we can delete this stuff and now let's say we want the image to look a little bit bigger so that it's nicer to look at. And we're going to add, so if we're asking people is hot dog a taco, we need buttons for yes and no, right? So we create a, let's add a, let's create a button and say yes with a hot dog emoji and a button for no with a taco emoji. So we're going to have people who prefer hot dogs and people who prefer tacos. And let's, uh, let's put those in a paragraph so that we have some default styling that makes it, that gives us spacing and stuff. So we have these two buttons, we can click them, and this doesn't really do anything. So if we want to be able to share these, um, we can do it in local state. We could have a counter that goes plus one when you click yes or whatever. And then we would have the state in, in our browser and if you would refresh the page, it would go away. If somebody else loaded the page, they wouldn't have that state and that's obviously not very useful if we want to find out what you guys think, whether a hot dog is a taco or not. So what we need to do that is some sort of backend and a database. A database will help us keep the data 
and a backend will let us communicate that data to the front end, right? So we're going to start by opening serverless YAML. And serverless YAML is a open source framework that lets you configure things like AWS or Azure and I think a bunch of others. I've only used it with AWS, so that's what we're gonna do now. We're gonna say that we want to start a service called Hot Dog Taco. And this service will, be, will run on AWS and it's going to use uh, runtime, runtime node 10.x, node.js 10.x, and we're going to say that our current stage is dev. This is, stages are kind, sort of like having different environments. You can say, I have a dev stage, I have a staging stage, I have QA, production, and so on. That lets you essentially create copies of your entire deployment. The cool thing about this new this brave new world of serverless and Jamstack is that we're going to configure our entire infrastructure in this file. So we're going to write a little bit of YAML and that's going to be literally our entire, data, our entire infrastructure. It's going to define our API, it's going, or our API gateway, so how to talk to our servers. It's going to define our Lambda functions that wake up and do actual useful work. We're going to define our database. Um, if we had queues or any infrastructure, it would all be here. So then when your coworker wants to copy your entire project, they can just run a command and they, and they set it up. So no more DevOps, no more clicking around or any of that difficult stuff. We're also going to define an environment variable called a votes table. This is going to be the name of the table where we collect our votes. And we're going to say that we start with the how do I usually do this? I usually prefix it with the, the name of the service. Then we say the name of the database or the name of the table. And we also do provider.stage. This way we can have copies of the database for every stage that we want. So we have a different database for QA and a different database for production, which turns out is very useful. And we're going to define a couple of functions. This is basically you can think of this, if you're used to Rails, this is like now creating almost a, Rails, a new Rails server or spinning up a new EC2 instance or setting up a VPS or going into your Linux and configuring an Apache server with, that, that talks to like a C-sharp program or whatever. I don't, I don't know what you like to use. I, I've been doing this for too long and there's just there's so many options. You don't want to know all of them. So we're going to say that we will have a GraphQL function this is, this is the name of our function because we are we're building a backend that is just running GraphQL. It's not gonna do much else. It's going to take GraphQL requests. I'll, sh I'll show you what that is in a little bit. And then it's going to save those to the database and read stuff back. So we have GraphQL. Then the next step is that we say, crap, I'm gonna copy paste now because I forgot things. So we, have, we say it's a GraphQL, ah, we define a handler and events. So our handler, handler is the, the, the function in our code base that runs when a request comes to this Lambda function. We say that it's in this slash handler dot GraphQL, and it's going to be triggered by an HTTP event that comes from get, and does what? Method get, oh, we need to define a path. So we're going to say path GraphQL. And this is basically, we're now defining the routing. We're saying method get, met, a GraphQL request goes to GraphQL. And we're going to enable course just so that we can make these requests from wherever. And we're going to copy the same thing for the post request because, uh, what's it called? Uh, GraphQL likes post requests more than it does get requests. So we've now defined our function. This is, base, this is essentially our entire server definition. This will be able to run code when we get an API request on, via, via the internet. It's like a REST request or whatever. Now we need to define the actual handler TS. We're going to write, this is going to export a GraphQL function that does all of the serving for us. We're going to import Apollo server from Apollo server Lambda. And Apollo server is a piece of backend technology that the Apollo, I think it's a company now, it's a startup, 
um, the X, I think it's the X Meteor guys. So they built Apollo and it comes pre-built with support for Lambda. So we can say, just start a server for me. And I think we're going to need a GraphQL tag as well. Let me verify that. Yes, GQL. So we say Apollo server and GQL. And we're also going to need uh, UUID. This is going to just define, we're, I'm gonna show you this later. I'm just gonna write it down now. Then we're going to define the types for our database. So this is GQL. And we're going to say that we will have a query. Uh, is it like that? Oh, it's type query. So we define a query type. A query type is how you read data from the GraphQL, from GraphQL APIs. We say type query for a vote. Uh, all votes, so we're gonna say all votes without arguments and it's going to return a bunch of votes. So then we define a vote which will have, what do we need to, to save a vote? We need some sort of identifier, whether the person said it's a hot dog or not. And it's always a good idea to save create at that timestamp so that you can later see when people were, vo were voting. So we say vote ID, which is a mandatory string and we say created at, which is also a string, and we're going to define is hot dog, which is a boolean like this. Yes, boolean like that. And we, so now we have a query, a way, we need a way to save the votes. We're going to create a mutation, and we're going to have a mutation that takes a is hot dog um, like that. So. This is a mutation that we're going to run with, a graph, with our GraphQL server, uh, with our GraphQL client. We're going to say this is, a hot, we're, this is a vote for a hot dog or not, and it's going to return itself. The next step, we're going to say uh, resolvers are, are, you can think of resolvers as functions that map from GraphQL, uh, from GraphQL queries and mutations to operations on the database. We're going to need query muta queries, and so we said it's an all votes, that's a function that is going to return a bunch of stuff. And we're going to have a mutation resolver, which takes a vote that, ah, come on, a vo vote that is a function that gets a some random parameter in the beginning and it also gets is hot dog like that, which is of type is hot dog. Come on, is hot dog, which is a boolean. B. So you know the Mac keyboards they don't work very well. Uh, that's the problem I'm having. Okay. So we now have the basic setup for our for our backend for our server. Then we can just say con, uh, export const GraphQL equals equals new Apollo server, which gets the type defs and the resolvers, right? Is that, was that correct? That was correct. Uh, no, we need to, cre I'm just gonna copy paste this because it's gonna be easier. So basically what we're doing is insta we instantiate the server and then we export a handler for our Lambda database that gets, that allows requests from anywhere. We, would, we should now be able to deploy this and have a service that runs on the internet. So let's try that. I'm gonna go to server and I'm going to run yarn deploy. And this is, this is running a build in the background and then deploying to the internet so that we will have a working server. Now while this is happening, we can spend some time on the front end so that we save time. We go back into index.js and we start hooking up these buttons so that they actually run votes on our database. We're going to call them vote button as a, um, what's it called? It's a React component. So we create a React component, const vote button equals a component that gets, let's say, is hot dog as a Boolean and it's also going to get children so that we're, we will be able to render the actual button. We return a button component with the children inside, like that. So we get the buttons back. 
then we're going to have a, let's have a uh, use mutation. Uh, how does use mutation work again? So we're going to, use mutation is a hook, is a React hook that comes from Apollo. So we're going to say import use mutation and use query from React, Apo React Apollo hooks. Come on. Um, all right, so, okay. And then use mutation, I'm going to cheat a little bit and I'm gonna check the actual, the exact, yes, syntax. So we're going to get a function called vote. This will execute a query over the internet as we just, as we call it. And it's going to have a loading, uh, a loading state. And we say use mutation and we pass in the actual mutation. So we're going to say vote mutation is going to be a constant that we use. And when the button is clicked, it runs the vote query. The vo Wait, is that how I did it? On click vote, ah, we need to pass in the variables. That's the part I forgot. So we're going to pass in the variables. So variables define where we're basically gonna say is hot dog is going to come from our props. So when the when we render it here, we pass in, let's say, is hot dog is true and is hot dog is false. So when you click the first button, the is hot dog prop is set to true, and then that goes into our query as is hot dog, which then gets passed into the GraphQL mutation, then goes on the via the internet with an HTTP call automatically to our server and then our server is going to do things and this is going to react. Uh, it's gonna make sense in a little bit. We're going to also add a loading state. If we're currently loading, we're going to say that we are voting, otherwise we render the button. So vote loading is hot dog. Now we need to actually write the mutation query. And this is what I really love about GraphQL, I'm gonna cheat again a little bit, I'm gonna copy paste this. So vote mutation. So what I like about GraphQL is that you don't have to go to your backend engineer and ask, hey, can you add this endpoint for me so that I can add votes to your database? You just, once you have the API exposed and once you have the queries available, you can run those queries any way you want and you can add, here we're saying that we want to get the vote ID and the created at part back after we vote. The, the backend engineer doesn't have to specify that. And you'll see in a bit that you really don't. It automatically, GraphQL automatically figures out which parts of the data you actually asked for and what you actually wanna do. And then all of this machinery, it solves a lot of the problems that I've always had. Uh, now it's complaining that use query is defined but not being used which is annoying, and we need to import GQL from, where do I import GQL from? From GraphQL tags, so see, copy pasting and doing things in advance is always a good idea. Um, now if I click yes here, it's, well, it's voting on my other server, because uh, we didn't do one piece of configuration yet. So let's see, this deployed, which means we can now take the URL uh, so we take the URL. Basically what happened here is that serverless deployed to AWS. We now have an actual AWS Lambda server running in production. And if all is right with the world, I should be able to go to this URL and get a Apollo Playground so that I can try my stuff, but it did not work. So this could be a problem. Um, what did I get wrong? Let's see. Let's go to AWS and we're going to look at the CloudWatch logs and see if they tell us what's wrong. And that's also one of the benefits of serverless. I got a lot of this set up by default without having to think about it. So I'm gonna go into my Lambda. And if we, oh, let me zoom in. Uh, okay, hot dog taco, where are you? So we have this one, hot dog taco dev GraphQL. You see it set up a hot dog ta taco dev GraphQL Lambda. It created an API gateway. This is the front end part that creates the actual URLs that then talk to my Lambda. And it's outputting logs to CloudWatch. So anything I console log in the, 
in our code goes directly there. So let's see if we have any useful debugging information. CloudWatch. And if it's not going to work, I'm just going to copy paste stuff so that we, so that I can show you it actually works. Let's see. Hot doc taco dev GraphQL. What is wrong? Uncaught exception. Error type GraphQL. Expected name found dollar. So I messed up my type definitions. Let's go see what I got wrong. So here, when I define the is hot dog, I used the wrong syntax because, let's see, er, ah, it's without the dollar. Okay. So now while we're here, we can continue improving the code. Let's say for all votes, I prepared some functions in advance that work with DynamoDB. So we're going to import scan items and uh, update item from dot slash DynamoDB. This is sort of like a wrapper I built on DynamoDB on AWS libraries that I need to open source and I want to open source eventually. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. So I'm not really going to show you the details of what's happening there. But we're going to say const result equals await. So this is an async function. So async. Async, uh, for those of you who don't know, it's just a, an easier way to write code that executes in the background and waits for each other. It's almost like doing threads, but not exactly. So we're going to say scan items. Is it scan items? Uh, what's it complaining about? Scan items, expected one argument, but got zero. I think we need to pass in this. So, and then we return result.items. And that's all we had to do on the back end. Um, for the back end, we, this machinery is now letting us scan an entire DynamoDB table and return all of the data. But what the client is going to get is only what it requests via the GraphQL query. And I'll show you how that works as soon as we get the playground running. For the mutation, I'm going to copy it because it's a little tricky to write. So we're going to, it's also going to be an async function. So we say this is async. We, we're going, we create the vote ID with a universal ID generator. And we, create the crea we set up the created at timestamp so that we know when something was voted. And then I'm, copy, I'm going to copy paste all of this crap. And this crap says that we are updating an item. So this is an upsert. If the identifier already exists in a database, we're overwriting it. But it turns out that the, uh, that the identifier never exists in the database because we're creating it here when the function gets called. So is hot dog, is hot dog, and we said here, yes, is hot dog. So I need to make sure that all the names match. So we're saying, find me the vote with this particular ID. If it exists, update it with the new created at timestamp and the new is hot dog value. Um, those are the attributes, and return everything that has changed. And then we're going to return result.item. Well, result.item, and that's going to, oh, come on. So the autocomplete is messing with me. No, it's, is it not item? Item does not exist on update item output. Let's just return the result then. So we've, this is most of our backend, and while we're here, Let's also just configure the, the database as well. I'm going to copy this because it has a bunch of things. And I usually copy this configuration because it's very fiddly. And again, this is something that I need to build a CLI tool around or something. So let's see. Uh, and the reason I'm doing so much copy pasting is because I did this project last night and it took me an hour. So I want to use copy pasting to make it shorter. So we're defining a resource called votes table, and that's a, of type DynamoDB table. It has a vote ID uh, key, and it's named based on this environment variable here. This will automatically create a database for us that lets us store JSON blobs in a nice way, scalable, and all of that cool stuff. So I run yarn deploy again, 
And this is again running a build in the background. So it's a TypeScript build and then goes into JavaScript and then the JavaScript gets packaged and deployed to the AWS that I just showed you a short schematic of. We're gonna wait for it this time because the next thing I wanna show you depends on seeing this. Um, so it's creating all of my, uh, I don't even know everything it creates and that's kind of the beauty of these tools that you don't actually have to know, you don't have to understand how any of it works. You just put it together and it works and you have a built, and you have a production app and that's, that's the beauty of abstraction, right? Because when was the last time you worried about CPU registers and memory allocation, right? Yeah. Uh, and how many of you have actually actively thought about it since college? Yeah, exactly. And that's the beauty of, that's, that's what we do as engineers. We build tools so that people after us don't have to think about the things that we had to think about. And I think that's the beauty of this profession. We're always making ourselves better by, honestly, by being lazy and not wanting to do stuff. Um, I mean, I use this as a silly example, but I remember reading the mythical man month. And in the mythical man month, the author says that inputting programs into a computer used to be a separate job from programming because it was so time intensive, it would be a waste of an engineer's time. And now we have compilers that do it for us. And that's amazing. So let's take this URL and hope that this time it's actually going to load. Open that. Let's see. Will the Apollo Playground show up? There we go. We have the Apollo Playground. I'm going to zoom in. And it's saying that server cannot be reached because they have a very annoying bug that they refuse to fix. The, the URL they get is wrong. So what we just got magically is the entire documentation for our API. You can click on all votes and you see that all votes returns an array of votes that have IDs, created ads and strings and so on. We have, uh, vo we have a mutation to vote and if I show you if we go into LAMB, into DynamoDB here, so I open DynamoDB on AWS, you will see that a database showed up. We go to tables, and voila, hot dog taco votes, dev. It's right there, it just magically showed up when we wrote a couple of lines of YAML. It's currently empty, but I can do this. I can write a mutation. How do I close this? Okay, so we're gonna write a mutation here real quick that is going to vote and it's going to say that this hot dog is in fact a taco and it's going to show us the, the ID that we got from that vote. So this vote got an ID and if I press play, it gives me an error. I am not authorized to perform this update. What? What did I forget to copy paste in my serverless YAML? Ah, yes. So one of the, it's both a great thing and a bad thing from Amazon is that they're very security conscious, which means that anytime you wanna do anything, you have to configure your IAM roles, which is a lot of work to do correctly, so I do it incorrectly and give myself permissions for everything every time. Um, so if somebody steals this code, they will be able to literally break everything, but I don't know, it's a demo, I don't care. Um, although, lesson learned, don't leak your Amazon keys on GitHub. I got my AWS account suspended that way and that was not fun. Uh, it literally took down all of my production apps, just went down because they were like, hey, you leaked a key and this is now insecure, so we don't trust anything you've ever done, ever. Um, okay, so this is deploying. Now, while this is deploying, you see we just wrote the mutation that we're gonna use so while it's deploying, we can put that into the front end. Oh, wait, we actually wrote that already. The other thing we can do is write the query that will read all of the votes back to us. So we're going to say all votes, que uh, let's say votes query, and this will help us actually see how things are doing. So we're, we have a query called votes, all votes, and it doesn't actually accept any arguments, so it doesn't need those. And it runs all votes, and for each vote, for each vote, we wanna get the vote ID, and let's say we wanna get is hot dog 
So is hot dog, because that's the type that we got from our docs, right? Yes, it says is hot dog boolean. Cool. So while that's happening, is it deployed yet? Oh, it already deployed, perfect. So if it deployed, let's see if it's gonna work when I press play now. I press play, cannot return null from non-nullable field vote vote ID. What? Why is that not working? So let's see, DynamoDB, it should show up at least. So if I reload this, the vote showed up. It's just our return types aren't working correctly. And how did they fix that last time? I don't think I actually did. Uh, not print. Let's see. Hadler, TS. Yeah, I think it was the return item thing. So we can fix this here. We're going to say return result item. And let's see. This is going to say that update item output doesn't have the thing. So let's go into DynamoDB. No, DynamoDB TS. Update item returns what? I just need to see the actual type. Update item params, get item params. So this is returning update item output. And this is one of the nice things about TypeScript is that I can go and see how the other APIs work without actually having to memorize everything. So it returns attributes. For some reason, it's dot attributes, not dot item. Seriously? A map of attribute values as they appear before or after the update item operation, no. Item collection metrics, yeah, that's, that's the one. So we return dot attributes attributes, and I'm gonna yarn deploy that again. While it's deploying, let's write that query. So we are reading all of the, oh, actually we can try it out in the play, playground. So I'm gonna run this query in the Apollo playground, and you'll see that we're using the same endpoints, and we get different outputs. So if I, I can only get a list of hot dogs as well. So hot dog votes. Now let's make a little, uh, here we're going to show the votes themselves. So the votes, and I'm going to copy paste it so that we don't spend too much time typing and I'm going to explain what it does. So we take the votes, copy pasta, put that here under the vote button. So we have the votes. Okay, I'm going to rename the query. It's the votes query. So Votes uses the get votes query, it has a loading state, and it returns a bunch of data. We, when we get the data, we say everything that is hot dog is a yes vote, and everything where is hot dog is false is a no vote, right? And then we render them yes, yes plus no gives us the amount of, the number of votes we have, and we get a percentage with some simple math, and we output that. Let's see, okay. So now I should have, in theory, oh, one more thing I gotta do is update the API endpoint. So I'm gonna go into the Apollo.js. This is a simple, this is again, this instantiates an Apollo client and gives it the server URL and tells it to use the fetch function to talk to the URL. So I copy pasted the new, the new endpoint that I have I'm going to restart my local server. Let's see, use query is not defined. Let's go define use query. So use mutation and use query. We're not using the link anymore, so we can delete it. We should now be able to, let's see if it works. We are here, and we, if it's saying that right now there is one vote, and 100% of the votes say that hot dogs are tacos. And if I click yes, it voted, and I can reload the page, and it didn't work. Why didn't that work? What if I click no? Let's see what went wrong. Network error, response not successful, status code 400. That's not nice. Let's see. It's probably, again, something with the attributes and stuff. GraphQL errors. So. GraphQL validation failed. Unknown argument is hot dog taco because it's, the argument is actually is hot dog. Uh, so is hot dog, is hot dogs. That's one of the painful things 
about uh, GraphQL in general is that there's a lot of repetition. You have to make sure that a lot of different things vote match just, just right. So let's see if it's gonna work now. I press yes, and I think it worked. Reload the page. It says two votes, perfect, yay. So we can now vote, and it's going into our database, and the database is doing all of the things and collecting the data, right? Now, I promise that you will be able to vote. So if I wanna put this in production, let's, let's do a magic trick. I'm gonna use now, because I like using now and Zite. Oh, oh, damn, that is all the way at the bottom of my screen. Let's fix that. So this, you can probably see this a little bit better now, right? Uh, where can I put it? Or let's just put it on a new screen. Okay. So just so that it's a little bit bigger and in the middle of the page, in the middle of the view. So I'm going to now buy a domain. Now domain by is hotdogtaco.com. Let's see if that's available. Uh, for $12, yes. So I now have is hotdogtaco.com. Uh, well, it's still purchasing, but in a little bit, my credit card is gonna get charged and I will have is hotdogtaco.com, I hope, uh, unless the internet is down again. Cool, so is hotdogtaco dot com is purchased. Now I can run the now command itself, and this is building my Gatsby server, uh, or my Gatsby frontend, putting it up on their, uh, I don't know what you would call it, on their platform, setting up CDNs, SSLs, making it really fast and performant, and once it's deployed, I'm going to be able to alias it to the domain, and is hotdogtaco.com will be live, and you will be able to go Tell me whether a hot dog is a taco. Um, let's see. How long did that actually take? Did it, was it like 30 minutes? I think it was a little longer. It's actually Zeit. So they, uh, let's see, do I have? So Zeit.com, it's kind of similar to Netlify. Um, so, like, well, Zeit.com doesn't exist anymore. Is it now SH? It's basically an, it's an open source tool backed by a startup do, building a platform. And I like using them because they were the first of these sort of platforms that I started using, so I got used to it. But there's, there's the, the two main ones that I know of right now are Zite and Netlify. There's also, I think, begin.com that's trying to do something similar. And I think we're gonna, there's gonna be a Cambrian explosion of these kind of apps, uh, it's, you can think of it as Heroku for serverless. So we got that done, and now if I say now alias paste to ishotdogtaco.com, and let's see if that works. Is hot dog, it's assigning the alias, setting up all of my DNS stuff. Um, I don't have to deal with any of that, I don't have to, it's, it, it's also issuing a certificate apparently. So. All of these things that I don't have to configure and I can just have a live website. Let's see. So this part might take a little while because it's a new domain. Usually I buy a domain like a day before. So let's see, if I go, now if you go to ishotdogtaco.com, you should be able to vote and, nope. Uh, maybe it's still too new, it needs to propagate. Okay, so that needs to propagate but you can go to ishotdogtaco.now.sh and that should work. Really? Yeah. It worked? Nice. Okay, so it's up. It wasn't, my machine didn't like it yet. Ishotdogtaco.com. Okay, there you go. So, wow, how does that have 107 vote, 136 votes already? <laughs> uh, okay, so 68. So far, 68% say that a hot dog is indeed a taco. Now, this is really cool, right? We built a, s okay, so people, people are curious about this question, apparently. <laughs> so, we just built this app, and we're collecting data on, on the cloud. It's really fast. It will scale to pretty much infinitely. And other than those $12, it's completely free right now. I'm able, because 
only when a query, like I'm not paying for any infrastructure, none of the servers are running, even the database isn't really doing much. So when you click vote, my, or when you reload this page, my server wakes up, handles that request in those 10 or 20 milliseconds, and then goes back to sleep, and just vanishes and I'm not paying for it. And right now, because I think they're trying to gain market share or whatever, AWS actually gives you a million requests for free. And I don't know about you, but not a lot of my side projects have ever gotten to a million requests ever, uh, let alone a million requests per month. So this is essentially free right now. Now, why would you want to do any of this, right? That's like, why, why would you build these things? And I, but why, right? Um, and here's, here's the reason why. I think the, the most, the important why behind this new stack, the Jamstack plus serverless, Gatsby, offline first, and all of that, is that you can own ideas start to finish. When you have an idea, you can own the entire stack. You can build the front end, you can build the back end, you can do your DevOps, everything you need until you are rich and famous enough to afford people to do it for you. So you can really own everything from start to finish. And I think we're, we're in the beginnings of a kind of a new revolution on the web. Um, I don't know how many of you remember back 10, 15 years when everyone was an indie developer and there were a lot of startups. I was just talking with some friends yesterday and they were like, you know, Silicon Valley doesn't really feel like a startup -y place anymore. It's just all these huge companies and people say, yeah, I work at a small startup, it's only 100 people. That is a huge company. Like 100 people is a huge company. And people in Silicon Valley think that's a small startup. But I think we're kind of getting back to that spirit, to that hacker spirit where it's five guys in a basement or ladies or whatever, or just you in your bedroom and you can have an idea and you can build a startup and build something really great and serve a niche market and just do something, something that you want to solve. And because of these tools are so empowering, you can do it on the side. So you can like get secondhand VC investment. Why would you go around and talk to a bunch of VCs if your CEO and CTO and all of those people can do that, pay you a fat salary, and then use that salary to fund your side hustle, right? Isn't that a lot easier than trying to get your own funding? And the last thing I want to tell you is a really cool, it's one of my favorite tweets on the internet. It's kind of old now, but basically, how do you make a million dollars? You either make a $5,000 product for 200 people, or you can make a $10 product for 100,000 people. And if you start, if you start doing like uh, subscriptions, you really only need like 2,000 users at $42 per month, and you're, you're a million dollar revenue company. And I don't know about you, I, even in San Francisco, would be perfectly happy with a seven-figure income, right? It wouldn't be bad. Um, and you don't need VCs for this. You don't need any of it because the tools are easy, the tools are simple, uh, they're cheap to use, and you can really quickly iterate and build ideas. And the internet is big. The internet is a big place. You can find 2,000 people to use your app every month. I promise you that. Whatever your idea is, there are enough people out there to you for you to find 2,000 of them. And you don't have to become a world, like you don't have to have a million, millions of users or hundreds of thousands of users. 2,000 is enough. You will be pretty happy at a million dollars a year if in your pocket because you can do everything yourself. You don't need employees, right? Um, so yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of what I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you that you can build an app really quickly and get it up. Uh, you can find me on swizzets.com, or if you just type swizzets into, into the Googles, you will find me. And if you're curious, if you want to learn more about serverless in particular, I am currently building serverlesshandbook.dev, which is kind of, the idea behind it is that it's a, the resource I wanted to have when I was learning serverless, and it's meant to be a handbook that's by your side as you work on this stuff and learn about it. So... It's, it's a work in progress. I'm publishing a chapter a week or so for, I guess, the next 20 weeks. Um, and we'll see how it goes. So yeah, I hope this, I hope this was interesting. I hope you had fun. And uh, enjoy the rest of your, holy shit. <laughs> Who tweeted this? <laughs> right. Um, and yeah, I'll stick around for questions and stuff if anyone is curious about things.